right, so sort of as a, a last lecture for this class, let's look at the cranial nerves. You've got a handout that looks like this, and you'll see the columns across the top. Um, one of the unique things about the cranial nerves is they're all numbered, and they're numbered with Roman numerals. We found this out as far back as the upper limb unit when we when we learned of this accessory nerve and the fact that it innervates the trapezius muscle. And in the muscle lecture earlier, I told you that trapezius and sternocleter mastoid are linked through that 11th cranial nerve. But you're going to need to know the numbers. You're going to need to know the names, right? You're going to need to know the origins. The origins are basically where the nerve comes from. What part of the brain does this nerve come out of? The passageway from the brain, all those foramina and fissures and all those things are basically passageways for many of these cranial nerves so that they can get from the brain out into the tissues that they interact with. And then the last column here, function, right, is going to give you some basics as to what the nerve is doing as part of the, and the letters here, S, M, and A, S, sensory function, M, motor function, right? And if you see A slash P, some of you should be able to guess that for me. What would the A stand for? Not action, because this is all action, but thank you for guessing. One of the major divisions of the nervous system, autonomic nervous system, and if you've done any study on that, right, you know there's a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division, and all of the sympathetic nerves come out of the spinal cord, and almost all of the parasympathetic nerves come out of the brain. Every autonomic nerve that is cranial is on the parasympathetic side of the system. So A slash P, autonomic parasympathetic. There are no sympathetic nerves from the brain itself. Okay? <clears throat> now, when you learn the names, you're prob probably the first thing you want to do is see if you can learn the names and the nerves. Probably what you want to do is, and many people have done this, take the first letter of each one and make up a sentence. Um... Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there was an old one was on, on on old Olympus towering tops. A somebody somebody did something to someone. I, you know, it was something like that. Um, somebody in class. I don't remember the whole thing, but it was something like our orange, our old orange truck um, transported avocados from, you know, but if you come up with some sort of a sentence, you can at least get, if you do 12 words in the sentence, you know, the first word is cranial nerve one, and the second one is two, and, you know, that kind of thing would at least give you some sort of reference point for um, which names are, are for which nerve. If you know there's a vagus nerve and the 10th word is a V word, then you know vagus is the 10th cranial nerve. Okay? So find a way, make up your own sentence. If you come up with a good one, share it with us. I should have more of these written down, but I don't. Um, but you want to make sure you know the name and which one it is. And convention is, whenever you write the nerve, you write the, the Roman numeral with it. Now, I tend not to do that on my test because some of my questions ask you to tell me which cranial nerve, which numbered nerve this is. So I don't give that away in questions. So on the test, you won't see the numbers printed next to the nerves. But any time you write that, you should do that. You write vagus nerve or vagus, and you put a Roman numeral X right next to it. Always. Okay? Now, where do they come from? What is their origin? Uh, well, you know what? Before we do that, let, let's look at the nerves themselves just quickly. Okay? Here's a, a picture of 
the inferior surface of the brain. All the bright yellow pieces are the cranial nerves coming out. You can see the numbering is from anterior to posterior. Those olfactory bulbs are the most anterior and the most superior of the nerves. And you know, if you picture a brain like this, they're just getting numbered from anterior to posterior and from superior to inferior. So just write down the anterior medial surface of the brain. And the names then relate to functions, but the numbers just come straight down as you see them there. So don't need to memorize this. You don't need to be able to point to something and name the nerve on there. We're not going to do that. Um, one of the things that you might want to notice here, and you can see that on your list, is 10 out of the 12 come out of the brain stem itself. If I asked you which part of the brain looks most like the spinal cord, what would you tell me? You'd tell me the brain stem, wouldn't you? Of course you would, right? This, this is mostly white matter like the spinal cord is. It's this long column. So figure every nerve in my human body but two. Every nerve in my human body comes out of something that looks like the spinal cord. They all, every nerve comes out of the brain stem or the spinal cord except for two. And that would be the olfactory nerve from the frontal lobe, from the cerebrum, and the optic chiasm coming out of the diencephalon. Right? So when you, when you divide it up, divide it up this way. When I do this, I, I do, oh, look at that. Divide it into groups of four, right? The number 12 is a great number because it has so many factors. You can divide it by two, you can divide it by three, you can divide it by four, you can divide it by six, and you always get an even division, don't you? Which is why there's always been this big sort of um, argument about using base 10 or base 12 for numbering systems. A lot of the English systems were based on base 10 or base 12. You know, the, the English system with pounds and pence and halfpennies and the feet and inches and all of that is all on a 12 because it's so easily divisible. But so, so many other things, the metric system and our dollars and cents are based on 10. But if you divide this into four groups or three groups of four, notice that the last four nerves all come from the medulla. The middle four all come from the pons. And in this upper four, the bottom two there, three and four, come out of the midbrain. So midbrain, pons, medulla. Ten out of the twelve come from the brain stem. And just the first two come out of portions of the higher brain areas. Now in terms of passages, as you look down this list, hopefully you recognize all these bony passages. If you've done enough study on the skull already, those should all be familiar. <clears throat> One of the things that will help you with these is learning a little bit more about the function. If you know that a nerve goes to the eyeball, you're going to expect to find one of the openings that leads into the orbit, right? And so you see a lot of superior orbital fissure here, right? In these nerves that go to the eye. Um, foramen ovale, foramen rotundum should be familiar to you. Of course, optic foramen for the optic nerve. Um, when we first studied the skull, you saw the ethmoid bone and its cribriform plate. And we could see how the two olfactory bulbs sit on the cribriform plate and the nerves go down through that holy structure into the nasal passages. So you can expect the cribriform plate is the exit for the olfactory nerves, right? Optic nerves. So a lot of these passages make common sense. Um, the last four here are mostly jugular foramen, right? Um, an auditory, a nerve that has to do with hearing is going to have an auditory meatus. And then there's a hypoglossal nerve, and that's where this hypoglossal canal comes in. So as you look at this, don't just try and memorize it. Look at it. Think about it. Why is the name there? And much of this will fall into logical place.
for you. Right? So it kind of works like this. These, these are the two biggies, if you wanted to sort of highlight these. Here, here are the ones, basically, that are going into the eye, and here's the ones coming down through the jugular area there. So probably the toughest part of this, kind of once, once you get the, the names down, the patterns here, and work on these, don't, don't kill yourself here because if you come over here to the functions, then you may be able to come back to this and put this together a lot better. <clears throat> when I'm working with these functions, though, I find rather than just try and memorize my way down here, one easier way to do this is to first pick out certain nerves that have common kinds of activities. And I sort of do the dividing of this kind of like this. Here's my little layout for this. Now, in my, I'm going to start over here. In my first box, I'm going to look for nerves that are purely sensory. Would you look down through your list for a minute, look in the function column, and find a nerve that has only an S. The only thing it does is sensory. This is really a one-way street. We've talked about mixed nerves. These are pure nerves. All of their axons in these nerves go one direction. Which are they? Number, number one, let's start... At the, Start at the beginning, the olfactory nerve. That's all it does is bring olfactory data into the brain. What's, what's next? Two, right? The optic nerve. And what's the other one? Which one, Shondo? Eight, okay, vestibular cochlear. Now, <clears throat> we haven't, on Friday, we're going to work with um, we're going to learn more about the eye and the ear as organs. That's going to be our lab on Friday. And you're going to learn that the cochlea is the sensory structure that turns sound waves into impulses that your brain can understand. So this is your sense of hearing and your sense of equilibrium. That, you know, how do I balance as an activity a lot of books call this the sense of balance. Balance isn't a sense, it's something you do. But equilibrium, knowing which way is up, it's really the sense of gravity, if you want to come right down to it. I can sense gravity and orient my human body according to gravity that's going to make me fall. <clears throat> so this is pure, these three nerves are purely sensory. Now, if you put those together as a group and study them, how, how far along are you? How much have you done? 25% done, aren't you? Quarter of the way by doing those three. <clears throat> now the other three that go together are mostly motor, and I have three nerves that work my eyes. Those six little muscles in the orbit are governed by three nerves. Which ones are they? Number... What would be the first, if you were going down the list, which is the first one you would hit that has to do with eye muscles? Number? Oh, sorry. Eh, I should have looked ahead. Back up for a second. Olfactory nerve, okay? I've got pictures of these nerves. These are the pictures from your textbook. Let's just take a quick look. Sorry about that. I should have looked ahead. Okay, so olfactory nerves, right? Cribriform plate, right? Optic nerves, remember the optic chiasm, optic tracts, optic nerves, right? Tracts are in the central nervous system, nerves are in the peripheral nervous system, right? Cranial nerve number two, this is how we usually see it here, right? And this is cranial nerve number eight, right? Vestibular cochlear, here's the cochlea, it looks like a little snail shell when you see it complete. And the nerve coming out of here is carrying your hearing data. And this is that portion, the semicircular canals here are the parts that allow you to tip your head different ways and you know which way your head is going because of that. So that data is coming back there. 
Okay, that brings us back here. Okay, now, three nerves that fit here. Number one, or the first one here, is oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three. It says what it does, doesn't it? It moves your eye, oculomotor. How many muscles? You know? This, this would be, you might want to just put next to it, four muscles here. Four eye muscles. Plus the eyelid, that, that little nerve, I, or that muscle we talked about, the levator palp brace superioris, that's attached in here. If there's six eye muscles and four of them are here, and I got two more nerves, right? I have the trochlear nerve, remember that? What muscle is that going to be? Superior oblique, right? Remember, that's the one that goes through the pulley, does its little oblique thing, but it looks like a rectus muscle most of the way. And then the other one, cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve. Cranial nerve six is abducens, and it works the lateral rectus muscle. So if I learn this sensory group and this motor group, how far done am I? Half done, right? I'm halfway done. So you see how this is a little simpler than looking at a big list that's got all these different things all mixed up. If you rearrange them into these two groups, you're most of the way done. Let's look at these nerves then, right? Here's oculomotor, and right, you can see the optic nerve here goes through the optic foramen. It's got its own canal for the optic nerve. Everything else that comes into the orbit comes through the superior orbital fissure. And that's where this oculomotor nerve is coming. And then the little individual ones, remember the superior oblique muscle comes through this trochlea, which is where its name comes from. So the, there's the superior oblique muscle, here's the inferior oblique. But that one nerve is just for that one muscle. And then the abducens here, the lateral rectus muscle here has been cut away so you could see stuff behind. But again, a single nerve for a single muscle. And if you, you say to yourself, what part of the brain does that come out of? Just think of your four, four, and four, right? Right? If it's cranial nerve number six, then that's in the five, six, seven, eight group, which is pons. Right? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve is medulla oblongata. Three and four is midbrain. Okay. So half done. If you if you do these and do these, you're halfway done. Now those are the bigger groups that make sense. Um, over over here, we're going to take the other six and divide them first into a couple of groups of two. So I've got two groups of three, I'm going to actually have two groups of two, and then I'm going to have two groups of one. So the group of two here, I'm going to put the trigeminal nerve, number five, and the facial nerve, number seven, together. Now this time, rather than them all being alike, I'm going to call these two complementary. How do they complement each other? If you look at the trigeminal nerve, the tri part there will tell you that it branches into three pieces. This nerve has three dominant branches. If you look at, it's, it's got some sensory and some motor. Is it more sensory or more motor? It's more sensory, isn't it? And all of the sensory data comes from where? from the face. The key word that you want to put here with these two nerves is the face. The trigeminal nerve brings all sensory, all feeling from your face back into your brain. The facial nerve does a couple of things. It's involved with taste and some other things, but what it's really known for is motor activities to the face. If you look at your list there, Highlight that M facial expression. Highlight that one because that's the biggie out of the three there. 
That's the one that is really what it's most known for. So the simple thinking in my brain, the foundation for learning all the details here is that trigeminal is primarily sensory to my face and the facial nerve is primarily motor to my face. If you get those two, you've got a lot. Let's look at the two, two nerves. Here's the trigeminal nerve, okay? Now look at it here. There's a great big ganglion. The trigeminal nerve, it's the largest nerve, the largest of the cranial nerves is trigeminal. Comes into a ganglion, and then I have three branches. Ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch, and mandibular branch. And here's how your face divides up. You see this? Other than the little bit of your nose right here, you just go basically above my eyes is one branch, from eyes to mouth is the second branch, and all of the bottom is third branch. Ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. This is, so if I'm scratching my cheek, my brain is receiving that right through the maxillary branch. If, uh, if I scratch my eyebrow, my brain is receiving that through the ophthalmic branch. Dentists need to know this nerve big time, don't they? Right? See where, like the mandibular branch? All sensation. If I'm, if I'm going to drill on one of these things and I need to deaden it, I need to know how to put that Novocaine near the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. If I'm going to work on one of the upper teeth, I need to know how to get that anesthetic to the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Okay? So almost completely sensory. Okay? Almost completely sensory. Here's uh, another picture of this. It's from another textbook. I really like this picture. Just like, ah. <laughs> right? Same thing. Here's the, here's the ganglion, and there's the three branches. Um, the only motor thing here is pretty simple because if you've learned your muscles in groups, all four mastication muscles are on the trigeminal nerve here. The mandibular branch hits all of the muscles that belong to mastication. So it's, it's a neat package. If you think of trigeminal as mostly sensory, you can catch that it's also uh, motor, but just that one nice neat group of four muscles. Make sure you know which branches are doing what here. Now, since this is primarily sensory, right, what's its complement? Well, its complement is the facial nerve. Here's what the facial nerve looks like. It comes out of that little stylomastoid frame. Did everybody find that little hole? It wasn't hard to find if you think of the name. Find the mastoid, find the styloid process, look in between them, and there's a little tiny hole there. The facial nerve comes out from under there. Here's the external acoustic meatus, comes out from under there, runs through a salivary gland here that sometimes can cause problems. If you get an infection in this salivary gland, right, the swelling of that can put pressure on the nerve and give you what's called Bell's palsy where one half of your face just doesn't have any movement to it, right? You've just got a blank face. And if this was an advanced class, we would learn the five branches of the facial nerve. Basically, the facial nerve comes out like this, and then it just, and all of your muscles of facial expression are on one nerve. If that nerve goes, the entire side of the face goes. You can't move anything. No expression. So... You'll undoubtedly see a patient, you know, in a medical setting from time to time that has the condition we call Bell's palsy, which is basically just a paralysis of one half of your face. It comes right back here to this facial nerve. Um, other parts of the facial nerve will go into taste. There's some parasympathetic. It's a little bit of motor here, but the facial nerve is really known for its connection to the expression expressor muscles of your face. Okay. So, if you put these two together as being complementary, sensory and motor in the face, <clears throat> those fit nicely together. The next two that I want to put together are complementary as well, and that is glossopharyngeal 9 and hypoglossal 
12. Notice they both have a glosso portion of their name. Both nerves that have glosso are here. And again, these have that complementary function. The hypoglossal is purely motor. The glossopharyngeal has some parasympathetic with it, but it's mostly sensory. And they both go to the pharynx and the tongue, what you might think of as tongue and throat. All the sensation in around there and all the motor function in around there are from these two complementary nerves. So you see how those kind of fit together? <clears throat> see how those would parallel each other? So if you think about them, learn them together as complementary. And now you've got all but two left, and the last two we're going to do individually. Right? So the last two, well, you know what? Let's look at these two. That's right. I've got pictures here. So there's the glossopharyngeal nerve. See, it comes out, sends data to the pharynx over here and into the tongue, tonsils, that area. Hypoglossal nerve comes down in and is innervating. You can see just, just like all of the muscles in and around your tongue, throat, swallowing. Um, you know, most of the hyoid muscles are here. Very busy, very busy nerve. So sensory and motor. Okay, last two nerves. Easy, easy one here is that accessory nerve. You should already recognize that. Remember, it's with trapezius and its partner, sternocleidomastoid. Purely motor, right? Here it is, accessory nerve coming out. Sternocleidomastoid, trapezius. Totally motor. You know, the same way I kind of put all the sensory nerves together, sometimes, and I think our textbook has done that too, is put all the motor nerves in a group, and you could do that. They just have less sort of a relationship to one another, being that they motorize muscles in very different places. So I kind of prefer to put it together in my way. You don't have to use my way. This is just one person's way of organizing right here. This is the way I made it up. The great thing about organizing is everybody can do this the way it makes sense to them. And if you're going to be a great student, if you're going to get all the way through micro and all the way through everything, you've got to be organized. You've got to be able to take data, put it in an organized fashion so that you can remember it easily. And organization is a lot easier to remember than chaos. Right? When you've got just papers and notes going everywhere and there's no organization to it, it's very hard to learn effectively. Okay, we've got one, one last nerve then, right? Last nerve, the vagus nerve. Now, that happens to be one that you might remember as well. We dissected this out of the cat. Remember that? When we were in the thoracic cavity, we found the vagus and the phrenic nerves. Vagus nerve 10. It's got a number of different things. You can see it's sensory, motor, and autonomic. But what is it most known for? If I was going to highlight one of those three, which one would I highlight? Number one, highlight its autonomic function, right? Most of those autonomic parasympathetic nerves from the brain go to, you know, tiny little things like... Um, you know, part of your, your taste buds or, you know, things, things like that. This vagus nerve is a champion. It comes down here, all of your thoracic organs, all your abdominal organs, right? Major parasymp parasympathetic innovation to the ventral cavity, right? Remember the rule of thumb here. If you put the diaphragm in here, parasympathetic stimulation slows down everything above the diaphragm and speeds up the activities below the diaphragm. I think I may have mentioned the recurrent laryngeal nerve that comes from the vagus that goes back up to the larynx and so you see motor there to uh, the larynx and the tongue, a little bit of activity back there but if you're going to highlight any of the three, highlight the autonomic function of this vagus nerve. Okay, so 
here is a way to organize all that functional stuff, two groups of three, two groups of two. These are things that are alike based on sensation and motor function to the eye. These are based on complementary to the face, complementary to the throat and the tongue. And then these two last ones, two threes, two twos, two ones. Nice organization, I think, for, for studying the functions. And once you get this function, as you can see, if you're looking at those pictures, you can, you can come back here. Once you've got this kind of down, you can come back here and go, oh, yeah, these openings make sense. The cribriform plate, the optic frame, and the spiriorbital fissure, right? All of these openings make more sense then. Okay, any questions then about cranial nerves? Anything here that we need to deal with? 